Um, my name is Henry Kim, um, and uh, we have today a speaker from um, Imperial College London, Louis Goodgen. Uh, I hope I got it right. Sorry, Louis. <laughs> I just never asked for your yeah, presentation. Okay, um, who's going to talk about DeFi 2.0 or DeFi uh, Finance 2.0 uh, online? And here as well is uh, uh, another co-organizer for this talk, which is Andreas Park from the University of Toronto. Uh, the third co-organizer is Andreas Fenaris, who I think, uh, if he's not here already, will be joining us very shortly. And he's in uh, at U of T as well in electrical engineering. My name is Henry Kim, and I'm at the Schulich School of Business uh, at York University. Uh, before I introduce uh, uh, Lewis, I just want to say this talk is sponsored by Fields Institute, as well as the Digital Currencies Project at York University. Um, York has a new campus, Markham campus, uh, and uh, one of, it has a research uh, uh, emphasis on FinTech. Uh, and some of the other people that are involved in this research project are people from this blockchain community, including Satiros Diascos uh, from York University, as well as Poonam Piri, uh, who's at the law school at Osgoode, uh, and uh, Joanne, uh, Joanne Jasiak from York. Anyway, I promised, uh, I promised Andres I wouldn't talk about York too much uh, because it's a Fields Institute thing. So that's all I'm going to say about the sponsorship. Anyway, let me get into talking about um, the speaker. Lewis is a fourth year PhD candidate in computer science department at Imperial College London. He is supervised by William, Professor William Nottenbelt. His background is primarily in economics, having first studied philosophy, politics, and economics as an undergraduate, followed by a master's of philosophy and economics research at the University of Cambridge. His work focuses on DeFi systems, particularly the design behaviors and risks of protocols for borrowing and saving, protocols for loanable funds and stable coins. And I've encouraged Lewis to talk also very briefly about his other ventures, which I think you might find interesting. So anyway, Lewis, with all that, please welcome to give your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks very much for that introduction. Um, and it is a, a real pleasure to, to be here and to give this talk. So, uh, yep, I, uh, to add a little bit uh, in the background. So I'm currently a um, fourth year PhD candidate, as was mentioned in the introduction. Um, when I started my PhD, it was really at the very beginning of the DeFi ecosystem. Uh, at the time, I don't think the term even uh, really existed. Um, and over the course of doing my PhD, um, we've just seen this uh, real explosion in uh, protocols, in um, sort of on-chain economic design. Uh, it's really been um, just a sort of fantastic thing to watch through, uh, through the computer monitor exclusively. Um, and so I'm a PhD candidate um, and also uh, an operator in the DeFi space as well. Um, I am uh, also one of the uh, main um, founders of a stablecoin um, project, uh, which is called uh, Gyroscope, um, mentioning that only in passing, um, but uh, yeah, this entire talk is focused on DeFi in general uh, and really wanting to uh, answer the question, is DeFi going to amount to finance 2.0? And what does that even mean? Um, and so, so to do that, um, my plan is as follows. So I'm going to um, give an introduction, um, really just definition of yeah. terms so that we can um, all be on the same page um, about exactly what DeFi means. I think that's actually in this context, I think that is extremely important because there is some misunderstanding that I've seen about what DeFi is. Um, then I want to move on to looking at the different DeFi primitives. So uh, I want to explore what the uh, fundamental components are of DeFi protocols uh, and explain the, the most important ones. Uh, and then turn to protocols. So uh, in this section, uh, I want to look at the different DeFi systems that um, exist in practice, uh, talk about them uh, in to some level of detail, um, and try to really flesh out like you know what is what is DeFi as as at least as I, I see it. Um, and then 
Yeah, I want to move on to uh, security. So looking at technical and economic security. And then finally, um, and this is where I really want to focus, this is on the open challenges for future research. Uh, I think that this is for sure one of the sort of most important things. And one of the things that I wanted to stress the most in this talk is to try to sketch out what I see as like the future avenues for new work and try to be um, as open as I can be about uh, all of the future challenges, because I think this is a fantastically exciting space. I think there is uh, so much work to be done. Um, there are relatively few people doing it. Um, and so I wanted to spend a good amount of time on, on this and, and sort of share my thoughts. Oh, well, Louis, so, before you go, sorry, yeah. quick question. How did you want to field questions, Louis? You want to wait till the end? Like, uh, how would you like the audience to ask you questions? So I think I think it would be best um, to bunch all the questions up together at the end. So once once okay. I've um, once hello, finished... Luis. Uh, greetings from uh, University of Toronto. I'm at the office. Usually, this Andrea. Uh, that's how we usually do it. I think it allows the speaker to have a flow and control the time. And then I think it would be better to listen to the talk. And then I can, of course, people can start typing questions. And then you, Henry, can go ahead and, and outline them. And thank you for being here today. Yeah, that was Andreas Baneris, who's the other co-organizer, Louis. Uh, and then, right. so folks, so, so if you have any questions, uh, I'll be keeping track of the chat. So I'll sort of, when all's all done and Louis is asking questions, I'll go through and, and sort, of re, you know, sort of redress those chats that you've said. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Louis. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Okay, so let's let's get into it. So, um, uh, so I should say, uh, so a lot of a lot of this talk is based um, on a paper that has been um, written with some uh, very um, great co-authors, um, and so the the some of the structure and some of the contents is uh, coming out of the reflections that we we had while writing this paper. So this uh, SOK on on decentralized finance. So. Yeah, my my thanks to all of the co-authors for helping with this work. So I thought it would be helpful to start actually with what DeFi is not, because I think this is something that uh, has been, uh, let's say, bothering me a bit, and I've observed for quite uh, for quite a while is this um, sort of conflation um, between DeFi and just like blockchain um, financial products or something like this, or just blockchains themselves. So I want it to be really clear that when, um, when I'm talking about DeFi or decentralized finance, this is not just equal to some amalgamation of cryptocurrencies, blockchains, or distributed ledgers. There's definitely a specific uh, idea in DeFi that is in addition to these other concepts and building elements. So Decentralized finance is really something much broader than just sort of blockchain based finance. It's the idea of having a financial system that is um, completely peer to peer. Um, and the spine of this financial system uh, is um, it can can be something like a blockchain or some other type of distributed ledger. What we see at the moment is that a lot of the uh, DeFi applications are indeed uh, on on a blockchain. Many uh, most, in fact, are on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but DeFi itself, I think, is best thought of as something that uh, sits on top of um, blockchains. It's not just equivalent to the these blockchain this blockchain layer itself. So when yeah, when I started my study of uh, of DeFi, when the term didn't exist, um, this essentially uh DeFi at the time was limited to a few very specific protocols so things like make a dow which i think many people uh owe uh, quite a bit to as an inspirational project um others such as uh, compound and ava which uh, give us, also give me for a second it seems yep. some people are in the waiting room okay uh, and i'd meet them so but i don't know if i'm the super host over here we need to yes I'm, I'm admitting them as they roll in yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So they're not waiting. Uh, our friends yeah. in the waiting room. Okay. Yeah. No, they're not waiting. All is good. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So, 
I, first, you want to talk about the, the properties um, of an idealized DeFi. So the first is that um, DeFi is non-custodial. So this means that um, participants have uh, full control over their funds at any point in time. So what this means in uh, concretely is that uh, users um, operate with a private key or something like this, and owning that private key entitles them to move funds um, and access funds at an address. And owning to own funds just is to own the private key to those funds. Um, but in, in this setting, no one is able to control funds on the user's behalf. Uh, it's, it is impossible to do so, or supposed to be impossible at least. Um, and this, this represents a uh, step change from uh, the traditional financial systems where, of course, everything is based on uh, the, the role that a custodian plays. So in a bank where the bank would look after your funds and you trust the bank to, um, to you know, well, be well behaved and, and not, to lose, not to lose the money that you've deposited with it. And of course, the, one of the original motivations for Bitcoin, and in fact, it makes it into one of the first Bitcoin blocks, is the financial crisis in 2008. Um, where I think they take the head, the uh, one of the Times um, newspaper headings and says something like "Chancellor on the uh, brink of a ba second bailout for banks" or something like that. So this, the motivation of having a non-custodial finance and non-custodial DeFi is really at the very, very core of the entire endeavor. The second property is permissionlessness. So. What this means is that um, anyone in the world is able to interface with financial services without being censored or blocked by a third party. So this is, uh, again, a very um, powerful concept because this means that uh, for individuals in uh, potentially unstable economies or in unstable uh, regions of the world, they could access financial services um, such as stable coins, but many other products as well, which are, would be very, very useful uh, without needing to uh, get, uh, you know, go through various processes that would be necessary to operate within the normal financial system. So this, this means in another way to phrase this is that, uh, you know, with a permissionless financial system, anyone can write to the blockchain. Um, you provided you have uh, some funds for the transaction fees, uh, anyone can modify the state of this, this global computer. You don't need to go through any sort of vetting process to do that. So the third property is that DeFi is, um, in its idealized form, openly auditable. So what, what this means is that anyone globally can audit the state of the system uh, just by uh, loading up some sort of um, blockchain explorer or something like this. Uh, and looking at the state of, of the different contracts or the different components in that system, and then verifying whether they think that these components are uh, functioning well uh, or not. And this is, again, something that is uh, a real revolution in how uh, the you know, revolution in openness of data. So if you think to one of the um, causes of the financial crisis in 2008, it was that a lot of the um, financial data and, for example, the amount of leverage that banks had taken on just wasn't that widely known. Um, so with, in, in, this, in this setting, uh, now anyone is able to audit the state of the system and verify whether things are working soundly. And finally, I think this is perhaps the most exciting property of an idealized DeFi. It is that it should be composable. So. Composability just means that you can take different uh, Lego-like building blocks within this DeFi ecosystem and just arbitrarily snap them together. So you can take any two pieces of code, you can create some uh, other piece of code that allows these two things to work together, and then you can um, build any, any type of financial product that you're uh, able to uh, think of and that uh, it could possibly operate within the constraints of the underlying blockchain. Um, but this, this composability is uh, something that um, we really haven't seen before in finance. 
This is a new, almost entirely new uh, property of, uh, of a financial system. And it really yeah, opens up uh, many possibilities, but as I'll talk about later, also opens up um, many um, quite, uh, quite serious and profound risks as well. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, the, so two views on DeFi. So, that, so this is, this is the view of the DeFi optimist. So the DeFi optimist thinks that uh, DeFi amounts to a breakthrough technological advance, offering a new financial architecture that is non-custodial, permissionless, openly auditable, pseudo-anonymous, and with potentially new capital efficiencies so the DeFi optimist essentially looks at these idealized properties of DeFi and thinks this, this looks great. Let's see where this goes. It sounds like we're onto something that really could be quite exciting. But then there's the view of the DeFi pessimist. So the DeFi pessimist has the following view. So the unregulated hack prone DeFi ecosystem serves to facilitate uh, unfettered and novel forms of financial crime. Pseudo anonymity permits cryptocurrency attackers, scammers, and money launderers to move clean and earn interest on capital. So this presentation, um, and I think the field of DeFi as a whole is really caught between these two different viewpoints about DeFi, um, whether it is something that um, is of clear benefit um, compared to the traditional finance or whether it's something that while introducing benefits is also introducing new and very serious forms of crime and harm. Um, and yeah, and I think this is something we need to take extremely seriously. Many people are, um, but I think particularly for uh, those of us who are um, you know, uh, writing software in this space, this is, uh, this is a very, very important thing to think about and to reflect on the consequences of actions in such a uh, globally accessible system. And so let, let's also just uh, get a sense of the growth of DeFi. So you can see um, how since, well, this is going back to the start of 2020, but of course you could take this even further back. Uh, I remember when uh, I started my PhD, the, I mean, back in 2018, this, uh, this graph, everything was very at very low values. Um, sort of 50 million or something on the on the axis on the y-axis, but you can see that there has been this um, incredible influx of capital in a whole variety of uh, DeFi um, protocols that have emerged in the last two to three years. Um, it's uh, really uh, been quite quite a spectacle to watch, and you can see that the the large components of um, DeFi use, the two largest, are lending protocols. So this is where you have some sort of on-chain capital and you lend this out and someone you know, someone can borrow it and they pay you interest. And then DEXs. So this is um, uh, just on on-chain exchange of, of crypto assets. Okay. So I am now going to turn to the the primitives of uh, of DeFi. So the the, the first thing to say is that there's this basic assumption which touches on this point I made at the start about what DeFi is not, which is that DeFi protocols just assume and require an underlying distributed ledger layer. So such as a blockchain, it doesn't have to be. But this, this ledger layer is an input into DeFi. It is not what DeFi equates to directly. Um, and so for that ledger layer, we assume um, various security properties are true. Uh, or that it's able to, to provide these. So mainly relating to data consistency, uh, integri integrity and availability. So these four things uh, are the main primitives and I'll spend a few minutes just describing these components. So, so the first thing in uh, a DeFi ecosystem are smart contracts and transactions. So what you need to uh, imagine to kind of wrap your head around this is that smart contracts are these uh, programs that essentially just uh, run and uh, uh, live uh, on a blockchain, essentially. I've heard it uh, put that way recently. I think it's a, a great way to describe a smart contract. It's this program that 
just lives on the blockchain um, and is able to interact with other um, programs that are running on the blockchain. Um, but what, um, what needs to be uh, realized is that these um, these program objects, they, they're not able to uh, themselves uh, trigger updates to state. So what if you want to uh, change things on the blockchain or nudge things along or update values in a contract, this requires some sort of transaction. Um, so the, there is, in a sense, no uh, equivalent of a, like a cron job or something like that uh, that can just be scheduled to run within a smart contract. Um, so these smart contract objects, um, uh, specifically talking about the, the context of Ethereum mainly here, these are uh, written in a programming language such as Solidity or Viper. Um, they are then um, compiled down into uh, the uh, EVM bytecode, uh, and then they are uh, deployed onto, onto the blockchain, which is a uh, global computer. Um, I... I'm uh, deliberately not talking about uh, how blockchains work in detail here, because I think this would be uh, just uh, too much material to cover. Um, but um, for anyone who's uh, a little unsure of the say mental model that uh, I have of a blockchain, it's essentially just um, a network of different computers all uh, running the same software to keep the same uh, view of some, some sort of global state so many synchronized nodes, um, and then these program objects run on, on these nodes. So yeah, the, the second primitive are keepers. So um, as, as I mentioned, um, smart contracts uh, aren't able to uh, internally generate these, these calls um, without some type of, say, nudge or some sort of transaction on chain. So the role of keepers are um, or, so keepers perform this function to keep things updated or to uh, ensure that if something has happened in the uh, off-chain world, um, it is uh, updated um, on-chain in a, in a timely manner. So um, for one type of protocol, which I'll get onto shortly, um, these protocols are concerned with um, borrowing and lending of funds. And um, in this situation, uh, the keepers can help with ensuring that for a loan that is uh, about to become underwater and is about to be liquidated, these keepers can ensure that the liquidation happens in a, in a timely manner. Um, but that this is the role of an agent that performs this separately to the contracts that are already deployed. So the third component um, are oracles. So Something that is um, important to realize is that a, a blockchain um, is operating in a silo from real world data. So anything that's happening off chain. So for example, if you have um, prices on an exchange that uh, are like a, a centralized crypto exchange um, that uh, are relied on by a protocol, an oracle is the way of the blockchain being able to access this off-chain information. So it's essentially this like import of uh, off-chain information on-chain. And you can think of many different uh, use cases where this, um, where oracles are important. I mean, you, it's very easy to think of them. It's essentially anything where you require off-chain data. Uh, and as the complexity of um, applications built on, on top of blockchains grow, it's easy to imagine oracles for weather information, oracles for you know, essentially not just financial information. Um, but these, these oracles play a, a critical role um, in, in the ecosystem. And then, so the fourth component of uh, DeFi protocol is some sort of governance mechanism. So once a um, contract is deployed, you might want to make updates to the parameters of that contract, uh, or once an entire uh, set of protocol uh, set of contracts is deployed, you might want to upgrade certain parts of the code base, or you might want to uh, agree on some mechanism that allows you to, to essentially change the system. So, a, a governance mechanism is something that is um, 
uh, critical in ensuring that um, these these updates can be made in a manner that is sound. And typically what um, we see with many DeFi protocols at the moment is that governance is actually uh, concentrated in the hands of uh, very few individuals um, operating as a, as a multi-sig um, perhaps. Uh, and essentially these few individuals are able to control um, updates to parameters, deployment of new contracts, transfer of funds, these sorts of actions. Uh, but we've also seen in, in some cases in certain DeFi projects, the emergence of much more sophisticated governance mechanisms where governance is ma uh, managed through uh, a form of um, token DAO where um, ownership of certain tokens. So where I say tokens, you can think of this as being uh, sort of like some type of cryptocurrency um, ownership of these tokens just is equal to some sort of voting power. So if you have a, a large balance of these tokens, or in fact any balance, you can um, vote on um, vote on governance proposals uh, in a um, somewhat democratic manner, um, and then the uh, changes to the system are made based on based on which votes pass and which votes don't pass, etc. Um, but yeah, so governance is is uh, an extremely important primitive for for DeFi protocols, and these are the four the four main components. So if you put these things together, you can get something that looks a little like DeFi. Of course, uh, it would be impossible for me to explain everything in in a sort of one hour slot, and I won't attempt to do so. But in, to, at some level of simplification, these are the main components. So now that we've talked about the, um, the main primitives, uh, so we were at this level, so smart contracts, tokens, oracles, and governance, um, we are now going to turn to uh, the protocols themselves. So in this figure, you can see uh, different types of protocol that exist. So here uh, we have on, on the right of the screen, um, Examples are uh, for exchange of assets. So this is on-chain exchange of two crypto assets, uh, loanable funds markets, uh, so borrowing and lending essentially, stable coins, um, portfolio management, and then derivatives. And then uh, I won't touch on uh, layer two and mixers so much today, but these are also other types of protocol that we see. So I'm going to start then with with on-chain asset exchange. So <clears throat> there are essentially, uh, so if it just, so let's pause for a second and just sort of imagine the, the problem that we have. So what, what we're essentially trying to do is find a way for two parties who are uh, not known to each other to exchange, uh, exchange assets in a, a completely decentralized and peer-to-peer -peer fashion, but in a way that is uh, critically not uh, relying on some sort of custodian to manage the um, settlements and order matching of some sort of trade. So, of course, this this uh, um, problem in the in the in the centralized setting is um, you know has been has been solved. You just go to an exchange, you trust them with your funds. Um, they are able to um, uh, yeah they store funds for you. You're then able to uh, use their different. Uh, order book matching algorithms and trade. Uh, and this is, you know, this, this can be great. And you, you can have very liquid markets on these, um, on these, on these uh, centralized exchanges. But then if you wanted to do this where uh, there was no trust, well, far fewer trust assumptions, uh, you would turn to on-chain exchange. And there are really two types of uh, exchanges, so DEXs that do this decentralized exchange, there are order book DEXs. So this is um, where you have, a, as in a centralized exchange, an order book of bid and ask prices. Um, and then uh, there's some uh, al algorithm that enables the, these bids and asks to be matched. Uh, the other option, which is uh, new in the context of uh, on-chain asset exchanges, automated market makers. So in this situation, liquidity is essentially just provided based on um, algorithmic rules and the prices themselves are 
um, just that, so they are algorithmically determined and they are spat out of a formula essentially. This is this is something that um, is a, a new form of uh, asset exchange that we we see on chain. So the, the so this is the first type of of uh, DeFi protocol. It's that for on chain asset exchange. So a second type that we have seen are um, loanable funds markets for uh, on-chain assets. So with, with loanable funds markets, what um, you have essentially are uh, protocols such as Compound or Ava, many others, where you're able to um, deposit capital. So you can take some, maybe a stable coin like USDC or something along these lines, you deposit it into a smart contract and you're paid um, an interest rate on the capital that you've deposited. Um, and that interest rate comes from um, borrowers who take this liquidity, they uh, are willing to pay some, some amount for it. Um, and they, uh, yeah, and they, it's as in essentially the operation of a, of a, a typical bank. Um, this is how on chain uh, loanable funds markets function. However, there is one critical difference, which is that in the normal setting um, with lending with traditional banks, um, loans are often um, uncollateralized. So you can go to your bank and say, I uh, want a loan for um, 50,000 euros. Um, here's my credit history. Um, and here's my address. So if I don't pay anything back, then um, firstly, you'll be surprised. And secondly, you know where I live. Um, however, in the on-chain setting, uh, of course, we don't have access to this information. So the mechanism that has emerged to allow this on-chain borrowing is to over-collateralize loans, which actually is slightly uh, strange if you think about it. This means that um, if you want to um, borrow, you first need to deposit something of uh, more value than, than the amount that you're trying to borrow. So for um, make a, a DAO, for example, um, if you wanted to borrow against the value of ETH, uh, you would need to over collateralize by a ratio of 150% uh, or so compared to what you can borrow. Uh, so this is, uh, and of course, this, this delta between the, um, the value of your loan and the uh, amount of capital you've deposited is supposed to just be this buffer against shocks to prices um, and to provide, uh, provide this uh, insurance in the decentralized setting that if something goes wrong, uh, the protocol is able to recover, recover its liability by just liquidating your collateral. Um, then there is, however, um, a new type of loan, which has also merged in the on-chain setting, which are flash loans. So when I said that loans are over collateralized, that is typically the case, but flash loans are the special example where uh, it is possible to borrow um, in a single transaction without fronting any capital at all, provided it is paid back at the end of the transaction plus, plus interest. So then another type of uh, DeFi protocol are stable coins. So um, this yeah, is certainly an area which I'm uh, deeply familiar with, but the uh, way to break it down is just into these um, five different components. But just zooming out for a second, I think the question is, well, what, what is a stable coin and what, you know, what are you possibly trying to achieve with, with these constructions? Well, the idea of a stable coin is to have a crypto asset that tries to be price stable relative to some target currency. So for example, the dollar, um, and then do this through some, some mechanisms. So find some stabilizing mechanisms that allow you to ensure that you have this on-chain asset that can always be redeemed for the, the, this value of like $1, for example. Um, and so, there are many reasons why stable coins are uh, an interesting um, field to, to be engaging with, uh, not least of which is that uh, one of the hallmarks of a lot of cryptocurrency 
the whole cryptocurrency space is extreme volatility in prices, which of course uh, has attracted a great deal of speculation. Um, but at the same time means that it is um, very difficult to uh, use um, crypto assets as a natural sort of means of payment because um, you're, you know, there's this inherent um, sort of fear uh, that you could be, um, you know, spending, I mean, there are examples of people who spent 10,000 Bitcoin on a pizza in like 2009 or 10 or something like that. And it's worth, I mean, you know, many, many millions and that, you know, most expensive pizza of all time. This is something that this sort of pattern um, of, of thought really makes um, very volatile crypto assets quite difficult to use. Um, and of course, as a means of preserving wealth, it's also not clear that uh, it is a wise decision to um, store large uh, parts of your um, wealth in assets where the prices are very volatile. It's taking away beliefs people have about the cryptocurrency space in general. It is just very risky to be participating in uh, such a, you know, taking large positions like that. So that's a bit of the motivation for why stable coins are, are interesting. And then um, these are the, the five main components. So some type of collateral, which acts as this like reserve. So you, you have this like pool of capital and someone has your on-chain stable coin and they're able to go to this pool of capital and say, I have uh, I have a hundred dollars worth of your stable coin, please can I have a hundred dollars? And if you've managed to put your stable coin together properly, you get back a hundred dollars. Um, there, there are then agents, so stablecoin users, but also people who perform this role of absorbing the risk that is uh, inherent in managing um, stablecoins, and in particular uh, in keeping um, keeping the stablecoins very liquid around, very tightly around the peg. Uh, then there are there's some governance mechanisms, so similar to the that I spoke about before. Uh, some issuance mechanism for stablecoins, so. The question here is how, how do you actually create new units of stablecoin? Um, and so uh, many different projects have, have different methods for doing this, um, but essentially the idea is to convert some crypto asset, uh, like X units of some crypto asset into Y units of stablecoins using some rule that's on chain. Um, and then finally, um, there's oracles, which are very important in the stablecoin context because when you're targeting a price feed, you really need to critically know the uh, the exchange rate against the, the target price itself, for example, the dollar. So then we have another type, so uh, protocols for portfolio management. So these you can think of as essentially just uh, decentralized investment funds. So here, um, uh, smart contracts uh, take capital and they uh, can run different strategies on this capital, which can vary in complexity. Um, but it's these are essentially like uh, you know uh, decentralized hedge funds for your money running on chain, um, but with perhaps without well certainly without the full sophistication of uh, of um, uh, an, a hedge fund uh, off chain. Um, and then um, we yeah so also uh, the these. The very interesting thing here is that the actual strategies themselves you can see. So you can see them coded up on chain, uh, and uh, it's you can inspect them. You can uh, look at whether you think they're sound and safe. Um, and this links back to the open auditability component of a DeFi that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and then uh, lastly, we have derivatives. So this is a relatively uh, nascent market um, or field, I should say, in, in DeFi, but uh, yeah, derivatives. So of course, just contracts which are somehow deriving value based on some underlying asset. Um, and we've seen some synthetic assets. Um, there's also uh, yeah, some futures have emerged, but this is not. Um, yeah, it's essentially there has been relatively little uh, development in that area. Um, some perpetual swaps, and then also, yeah, there's some market for options that's emerging as well. Uh, but this is, yeah, all, all quite nascent. But as is uh, much of the rest of the ecosystem. So while I was putting these slides together, I was uh, a little concerned that I it would be a bit sort of nebulous uh, talking about these DeFi protocols and like what they are and 
these sort of creatures living on a blockchain, it might not really make any sense to anybody. So I thought it might be helpful to include a um, just a, a few sort of images that demonstrate what a DeFi protocol actually looks like. So um, I've taken uh, MakerDAO uh, as, as my example, um, because uh, this is certainly a project that I've found most inspirational in this space, and I think really kickstarted much of, uh, much of DeFi itself. Uh, and this is this is what you would would typically see. Um, and I'll be very interested in the questions to sort of hear about whether people have uh, actually used DeFi protocols such as Maker. Um, but so here's here's just the front end. So this is the this is the website, and you can uh, and what to think about here is that this is like a front end that is interfacing with a blockchain that is just completely sort of hidden in the background. Um, and this is uh, the say. Uh, ideally the sort of user-friendly uh, way to use a DeFi protocol. So you would have some of your funds uh, in, uh, in some wallet that you can easily access. And then you can, you can sort of you know, click, on, click on these different components and uh, you should be able to sort of interact with, with, the, with the protocol. And you can see in the background, these different uh, maker vaults that have been created. Um, but then this is really just the front end. What does the protocol look like in terms of design? So you can see for um, the, the, the core um, contract for Maker, this is the sort of complexity that's involved in, in its design. Um, and so don't worry, I'm not going to talk through all of it. I have, uh, yeah, I find the, uh, the naming has, all, has brought me great joy throughout the last few years of the different Maker components. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the main auctions are the, the flip, flop, and flap auctions. Uh, they have very sophisticated, you know, they operate, they do completely different things. Their operation is uh, very nuanced, sophisticated. The docs describe it far better than uh, I should attempt in, in this talk, and it would, uh, it's not relevant for me to do so. But you can see from this diagram that this is the, so each, each of these uh, components reflects some different aspect of the protocol. Um, most often some contract that is um, calling another and you can see just the complexity for one protocol. And then finally, what does, once you have the design, what does this protocol actually look like? Like, what do you end up with? And this is where we have the, the on-chain components. So this is a, just a snippet of the Solidity code. This is written by a smart contract developer. Uh, it then gets, um, compiled down, deployed onto the blockchain. And this is uh, directly uh, taken from the, the GitHub for the, for the code that was deployed for the VAT, uh, the VAT contract. So I just wanted to try to make it extremely concrete what a DeFi protocol actually looks like, what it really consists in. OK, so I'm now going to talk about um, the two different types of security that are very important. So. The first type of security in the DeFi setting is technical security. So what, what, what I mean by technical security is that um, a DeFi protocol is technically secure if it is not possible for an attacker to atomically exploit the technical structure of the protocol, any interacting protocols, or the underlying blockchain at the expense of value held by the protocol or its users. So the key distinction here is that technical security purely relates to the uh, technical features that uh, are true or that exist uh, for a particular smart contracts or set of smart contracts. Um, and one, one thing to note is that in the context of DeFi, um, the transactions are atomic, which means that they either um, execute completely uh, or they don't execute at all and revert and there's no state change, which means that um, it's possible if there are technical problems to generate risk-free profits um, because if it fails, the transaction reverts. So let's look at a few types of technical security. So. Um, one of the most famous is reentrancy. So um, reentrancy essentially is just when uh, a 
contract, um, one of these program objects is deployed on chain, it gets halfway through updating some sort of state, and then uh, there's a, a call or some, uh, some control uh, is passed to some untrusted contract, um, and it's called with, with enough uh, like gas, so like compute resources, uh, and then this untrusted object, this other contract object, is able to just uh, repeatedly call the sending contract and just drain the funds. So essentially, it's just exploiting this like partially. It's sort of this moment where the contract, your contract's guard, is down, um, and an untrusted contract is able to exploit it while it's while it's interacting with it. And yeah, this is a real problem. So here's an example: DeForce. Uh, this was hacked, uh, and this was a twenty-five million dollar hack. And something to say outright is that uh, there have been many spectacular hacks in the DeFi ecosystem. It's close to a weekly event. I think it might actually be more frequent than that. And I, having seen many of the hacks in recent weeks, 25 million almost looks like uh, they got away uh, in you know quite good shape. There are um, many, many hacks that exceed $100 million in, in size. So then there's uh, integer manipulation. So this is uh, where, uh, due to the, the way that uh, Solidity, um, for example, handles uh, integers, it's very easy to have uh, underflow and overflow. This has led to problems. So uh, YAM was a protocol that uh, experienced a large loss of $750,000 due to a scaling mistake in a contract. And then there are logical bugs. So these are just uh, simple uh, programming errors. You just make a mistake. Uh, and you deploy it and you don't realize and yeah there are many examples of this and well bzx lost eight million dollars um so i want to talk about the um second a second type of technical security risk which are single uh, single transaction attacks so in in this setting um it's possible to successfully execute an attack um, without needing to know about some other transaction that's pending. And the most the, the, the thing that's used by these, these attacks is the atomicity of the transaction and also the fact that contracts are composable. So, um, so, so two examples. So firstly, um, governance attacks. So this is where uh, you take a large number of governance tokens and you're able to change system parameters um, before um, this sort of system realizes this is a this is a single transaction attack. And this, uh, if you want to know more about this, there's a, a fantastic uh, blog post that was written in, I believe, 2019 by Mika Zoltu on MakerDAO, and it was entitled something like "How to Turn 20 Million Dollars into 340 Million Dollars in I don't know 20 Seconds or something like that." Um, and then this uh, actually did then go on to happen to Maker. Um, and then the other type are uh, single single transaction attacks. So this is where uh, an attacker is able to uh, depress the price of one of the price feeds on chain and then exploit uh, some other on on chain element like an AMM. Um, so it just creates this like price imbalance in the AMM. It's then able to um, benefit uh, greatly from this imbalance and then uh, through perhaps uh, yeah. Uh, the sale uh, of uh, tokens within within the pool, or um, yeah, or just a straightforward arbitrage, uh, and then it's able to revert the the initial uh, imbalance that was created. So hopefully the cost can be can be covered in that way. Um, okay, and then finally um, on technical security, there are transaction ordering attacks. So. Um, the first type is um, displacement attacks. So this, uh, well, I actually just want to provide a, a bit more background. So what you have to remember is that in this setting, transactions are executed in a certain order within a block. So, and the, the, the uh, order in which these transactions are executed will typically depend on how much you've paid for that block space. So if you're if you are willing to pay a, a large gas fee, you can get your transaction uh, or large transaction fee. You can get your transaction executed early on in the block. Um, if you pay a, a low fee, you risk not being included in the block. But if you can set the fee at the right level, you might be included, but at the end. 
so the the great thing about this from the point of view of the attacker is it enables you to send two transactions you know when they will roughly be executed or you can hope um and and then if they're executed in this order you can wrap them around some other transaction that's your target transaction and essentially manipulate the the, the price in one direction um affect deterministically in amm and um so an automated market maker um and then um and then run another transaction uh, which enables you to um, recoup some of the costs. So these are these sandwich attacks where this target transaction is sandwiched um, between uh, between these two attacker transactions. Um, so we, if uh, people are particularly interested in these, we, we can perhaps talk about them a bit later. Um, okay, and then my last thing before talking about open challenges is to talk about um, economic security. So this is something that is um, a particularly acute and um, novel form of risk in the DeFi setting. So, um, so DeFi protocol is economically secure if it's economically infeasible to manipulate the equilibrium of incentives among all interacting agents to extract value from the protocol or its users. So what this means is leaving aside purely technical matters on the blockchain, a protocol is economically secure if you know that the, the incentives of agents in the system cannot be manipulated in such a way that they will start to act against the interests of the protocol. Um, and these, this sort of exploit, these are non-atomic. So this means that they, um, they don't either succeed or fail um, they might, um, um, or sorry, I should say, they don't either succeed or revert. They could uh, fail with some cost. So these, this sort of transaction is not risk-free. Uh, attack is not risk-free. Um, so one of the ways that, uh, one of the sort of economic security mechanisms that's been used is over collateralization. So this is um, um, what is uh, used in the case of Maker. Um, and the idea is you just you have you have loans, these loans are over collateralized. If you have um, the capital that's over collateralized these loans, if it start if it loses value, then um, hopefully it doesn't lose value so quickly that by the time you've sold it, it has lost more value than the liability. Um, if that does happen, of course, it would be unprofitable for a liquidator to initiate liquidation. And that would be from the point of view of the protocol, uh, something of a uh, something of a problem because they would uh, not have the capital to cover the to, to cover their liabilities uh, and we saw many uh, uh, unfortunate effects of um, of very very severely negative price shocks on uh, uh, black thursday which was in uh, march 2020 um, and then yeah there's also minor extractable value so as i mentioned it's possible to uh, determine the order that these DeFi protocol transactions occur within a block. So naturally the question emerges, well, what's the, like, how, what's the, what are the maximum ways to extract value from these blocks? Um, and of course, um, DeFi applications um, have created many new types of MEV. Um, not all MEV is, is, is bad. Uh, some of it is like in the context of liquidation, um, it's it's useful that it's possible to extract this value, but of course, um, in situations where uh, MEV results uh, in um, miners excluding or reordering transactions, um, or uh, yeah, essentially generally causing instability or potentially instability at the consensus layer, this can start to become quite an existential risk for the integrity of the underlying blockchain. And then we have governance risks as well as another type of economic risk. So with governance risks, um, the question is like, for those who are stewarding a protocol, what, what are their incentives and how, how can we uh, ensure that governance is incentive compatible as I, as I have in, in the first bullet point. And in DeFi, incentive compatibility has a slightly uh, say different meaning to that the, of the sort of formal definition in economics and incentive compatibility in, in DeFi is 
uh, commonly taken to mean just that uh, governance is uh, operating a DeFi protocol sort of as intended as the protocol designer intended it to be operated. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, um, the, the question is like, for those governing the system, are there like other long term interests successfully being captured or are they behaving in a way that's uh, essentially just short, looking just on short term outcomes, short term payoffs, um, and things that uh, can lead to profit for the governors in the in the next sort of few few days or weeks, but the protocol itself, uh, yeah, it you know could really uh, be making decisions that are against its long long run interest. Um, and then uh, finally, there's a market and oracle manipulation. So this is where um, with oracle manipulation, firstly, so this is uh, essentially just if you can control the uh, the way that information is being imported into these smart contracts, then you can manipulate it and you can potentially manipulate this uh, to, uh, to a profit. Um, and then market manipulation, uh, this is of course a problem in, in all financial markets, um, but this is a particularly a problem um, in, in DeFi where everything is, uh, yeah, there, there are no KYC processes, um, and uh, you can, um, be because the system is permissionless, you can uh, essentially uh, control sort of, you know, many, many different aspects, observe the effects of controlling these aspects. Uh, and you might be able to sort of arbitrarily uh, inflate or deflate asset prices, knowing that this is going to have certain deterministic effects elsewhere on the, on the, in the DeFi protocol. Okay, so, so lastly, um, and most importantly, I want to spend a few minutes just talking about the um, areas for DeFi, uh, future DeFi research and the open challenges and the things that I think are um, interesting and worthy of future research. So, the first major area is composability. So we've seen many attacks in DeFi have emerged as a result of being able to compose two contracts together in ways that um, no one really anticipated were possible. So the question arises, how, how can we safely compose protocols together? So how if you write a smart contract, how can you be sure that in the future it won't be able to be used in ways that you didn't imagine uh, and couldn't have foreseen? And this, of course, is very difficult. Um, and we have very, very basic um, tools at the moment. And the state of research is extremely limited in, in this area. Um, one promising approach is for just program analysis tools, essentially, um, which are either fully automated um, or or um, semi-automated where a user essentially is, um, or a developer is writing a set of unit tests on, on different parts of the code base. Um, but the problem is that these tests work in isolation from the rest of the, the sort of set of contracts that are already deployed. So when you're testing, you're, you, while you may test the, you know, the happy path of your contract, or you might, uh, test that uh, even with like the, if you're integrating just with one other protocol, you might be able to be quite sure that um, what you're doing is sound. Um, of course, uh, you won't be sure that you've covered all of the risks um, and tested all of the edge cases. And this is extremely challenging. Um, but I think one very important thing is to essentially uh, move beyond unit tests and look also at composability tests. So secondly, um, and I think this is uh, very rarely discussed in DeFi, um, but is of such fundamental importance, is the privacy and anonymity. So here you can see um, just a snapshot I took from Etherscan, which is showing on-chain transactions on Ethereum. Um, and you can see that um, 
you know, these where it says from these these are addresses. And if you're able to link one of these addresses to a real world identity, then you, you would be able to see everything that, that that person had done with that address. I mean, it's by like as a result of the open and permanently stored nature of the data on a blockchain, once you know, once you know the address, you sort of have this cascade of information where you're able to just know everything. So uh, Ian Myers uh, has this um, fantastic quote that, uh, you know, so crypt cryptocurrency is just Twitter for your bank account. You're tweeting transactions. And this, I think, is a, a real problem because, of course, um, for individuals, there's no privacy about, like, you know, how, how much... Uh, how much funding you have on chain or what you're doing on chain and um, which protocols you're interacting with, uh, which comes with potentially real security risks. Um, and then for commerce, this is another big problem because you, um, you know, commerce relies on uh, often quite secret agreements between different companies. If you started to require the payment flows between different companies all to be entirely on chain, um, this is, uh, to my mind, it's not exactly clear how this is actually very practical because there, are, there can be good reasons for wanting to keep that information private. And then there are many other problems as well. So um, scalability. So um, one of the notable features of uh, using any sort of DeFi protocol at the moment is that the fees are, uh, can be massive. You can easily pay hundreds of dollars for single transactions or single interactions with different protocols. Uh, and I've uh, personally heard many people say, you know, I would have, I would have experimented more, but it just wasn't worth it. You know, it was going to cost me four hundred dollars just to deposit twenty dollars of capital. This is, of course, um, limiting innovation uh, and the ability for people to just experiment and play around. There are, you know. There are people are working uh, on solutions here, layer two solutions in particular. Um, this is not a, not a novel observation, but I think this is one of the most important aspects that uh, DeFi needs to contend with is scalability. Um, there's MEV, minor extractable value, which can lead to consensus and stability. Um, oracles, you know, it would be um, great if we could somehow find ways to just um, develop, you know, ways of verifying the data we're getting off chain, on chain somehow. Is there some way we can just increase the integrity of these price feeds and just be more sure that in where we're relying heavily on these Oracle price feeds that they're actually correct. And then finally, um, governance. So how, how can we structure governance incentives to um, make sure that the protocols are being stewarded properly? So just to wrap up then, so, so here's the question. So does, does DeFi uh, equal finance 2.0? So the DeFi optimist, you know, I think they might be quite positive. Uh, the open auditability in particular of an on-chain uh, economy, the fact that you can see everything that's going on, this is you know, potentially a radical uh, gear change in the amount of financial transparency we have, um, potentially the amount of control that we can have over our over our economy. We could you could imagine just a dashboard that shows you you know the health overall of this blockchain economy, and everyone would be able to trust that uh, the data was being correctly reported, and um, no no one was able to conceal anything. Um, but then, lastly, there's the view of the DeFi pessimist. So. While DeFi is fundamentally and radically an open financial system, um, it means anyone can attack protocols um, and anyone can see when an on-chain protocol is unhealthy uh, and they can anyone can spot bugs. And as a result, the error margins are tiny. So I just wanted to finish with this example of just how, how thin the margin is and how big the stakes are. So here's, here's an example of this uh, hack that Oh, well, not hack, but mistake that was uh, made in the uh, comptroller contract within Compound a few months ago. You can see on line 1217, there's this loan greater than sign. This should have been greater than or equal to. And as a result, this led to accidentally paying out more than $70 million of comp rewards. Um, and this 
was you know this uh this sort of bug i i contend anyone could easily make a mistake like this um it's so tiny uh and yet the mistakes or the consequences of these sorts of mistakes are um so grave in this setting where there is no margin so yeah i think the DeFi pessimist uh has uh, many reasons to to feel pessimistic as well uh okay so i think that's um more or less my 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 time so i would be yeah, delighted to to take any questions okay so thank you thank you very much to listen